Welcome to the Awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listings photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. You are listening to Osmers.com podcast episode number 123. All you need to do to find today's show notes and details is go to Osmers.com slash 123. We even today will have a special link for finding Troy's company and even saving a little bit of money off an offer that is being promoted and and sponsored by the Empower e-commerce cooperative in cooperation with Seller.Tools. Now, Troy Johnston, as we've already uh, uncovered in the prior two sessions with Troy, uh, that he's brilliant as an entrepreneur, he's learned, he's picked up a lot of lessons, and he's dropped a lot of insights about how you can operate your e-commerce business and how you should think about your Amazon Marketplace-centric business as well. We're going to pick up today where we talk about more lessons, we talk a little bit about the future as well. And I just, I love hanging out with brilliant entrepreneurs, and Troy is certainly no exception. Let's get into this episode right now. Okay, we're back again, everybody. Steve Simons is joined again by Troy Johnston. And Troy and I were talking um, uh, in the past, uh, you know, in the prior segment about this idea of it still is a great time to be in the internet business, even on the Amazon marketplace segment of the business. It kind of depends on your perspective and, and where you're coming from. If you decided today you want to sell a silicone spatula, it's going to be a tough road uh, ahead because there's a lot of people who have decided they're going to sell silicone spatulas, right? This is just a reality. Um, whereas there are still plenty of opportunities in the, the tens of millions, maybe it's, uh, how many items do you know uh, does Amazon have online uh, right now, Troy? Any oh, idea? boy. Um... <laughs> It's tens of know. millions, maybe low hundreds yeah. of millions, honestly. My, my, my impression is, I, I know this much, for example, there are about 100, millions, uh, 100 million items online with Amazon in the United States that are prime deliverable. So it's 100 million items, just prime deliverable. We know there's many others that are uh, merchant fulfilled. Uh, Walmart, for example, only has 2 million uh, items that have uh, 48-hour delivery, two-day delivery. So obviously Walmart's got some some catch up to do. The point is amongst all of that opportunity, both in the developed marketplace like Amazon, there's plenty of products that still have uh, greenfield opportunity in my perspective. And then there's other channels that that you talked about in our earlier segment that you should consider. Maybe Walmart's one of them that's applicable to your product. Maybe it's not, but there are other marketplaces. There's other ways to build your brand. Um, And so as we carry on today, uh, Troy and talking, What's a, a big lesson that you've learned from your journey thus far? Um, you know, I think I think bringing back in terms of uh, sort of the team, the people that I'm surrounding myself in terms of my new ventures, I think that's that's such a important piece, especially for those that are maybe going out on their own. Um, I, I, you know, and talking about my origin story, I didn't I didn't think about it, but it's such it's such a great reminder of. You know, somebody along the along the time of that that those initial foundational foundational pieces, and now where I'm at, where now I've built and sold businesses, I've consulted for brands, and now I'm doing you know the software side of things, and it's the people I'm around, and who you know who were, uh, you know what skill sets that we're bringing, what things that we're prioritizing, how we're how we're collaborating. Um, so I don't know, my mind my mind goes there um, in terms of just being cognizant of that. You know, if, if somebody's just coming in in that same vein of just coming into this space. I think you always have to be very mindful of your, your resources uh, and people power as well. 
I've learned a lot from, from hiring, onboarding people. We're adding a number of people to the seller.tools team. And so there's a lot that goes into um, really, really thinking about what you want to get out of getting into business. You know, is, is it a cash flow play? Do you want to, you want to have a business that just throws off money? Because there's Amazon businesses that do that really well. Do you have a larger vision where that's going to require people? Do you need to lay the foundation in the beginning for that? And kind of uh, sort of way resources for, it or, uh, you know, sort of plan things in such a way that you, you have structure, you have a foundation, you have systems uh, built into that. So um, I think that's been, that's been always kind of top of mind for me um, with, with how we're, how we're growing things now. Obviously, uh, as, as you may be able to tell, our vision is pretty big uh, with what we can do with, with Amazon data, with, Leveraging our team's know-how, we're all, you know, most of the team is running brands themselves, so we're always we're in the trenches every day. So we know what we're worried about, we're anxious about what we want to see out of the platform. So we kind of want to leverage that and, and let that show up in in the tools that we use. So yeah, I love that, and I, I do think it's an important lesson as you know for somebody who's been on the journey for a while like yourself to be able to reflect that you know teams can be a real um, additive part of your life. And they can also destroy your life. And, and the, if you do it wrong, if you don't hire well, if you don't um, retain in, in proper fashion, you can find that in many cases, uh, when you hire people, uh, one of my axioms is every upgrade is a downgrade at first, right? So when you first hire somebody, um, I think uh, there's a, a good buddy, he calls it the trough of sorrow or whatever, that you know, there, there's an initial period where you're actually working harder than you were before to bring up this new person and to teach them and to show them the systems and, and so forth. But that investment is what pays off over the long haul. It's what gives you time and scale and so forth. And too often, especially if we either A, make a bad hire or B, we abdicate or C, we get caught up in that trough of sorrow where we're not committed to the long-term return on investment of that, that human resource, we're we're missing the big picture. And so you you know, you talked about this idea of knowing where you want to go to begin with. I think that's really important. At what point did you know where you wanted to go? How early on in your journey was it before you decided how, you know, what you wanted out of your business, your, your why, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And I think each sort of each major phase of my, my journey, it's sort of been the objectives of where I'm, where I was at. And so, you know, building kind of the flagship brand in the, in the beauty space, I knew my vision was was large enough. I had kind of a, a, a ballpark of where, where I wanted to be when that company and that brand was acquisition ready. And so that kind of led to be have enough of kind of a roadmap and uh, sort of a lead way of, okay, if I, if I need to be at this point, what do I, you know, what does that look like? What parts and pieces need to be there? What kind of transition pieces need to be readied? Um, you know, everything kind of leading up to that point. And then you know, the next phase was I moved into, you know, moved into consulting. What did I want out of that? How many clients, you know, what kind of structure? Um, and similar to the SaaS space that had a whole, there's a whole different ball of wax dealing with client expectations. I'm used to, I'm used to running my own thing and, you know, my own systems and those types of things. And even though I brought that into the consulting space, it's just so first time consulting is really, you know, it's, it's just very ambiguous. And so, you know, when you touched on it before, I'm, I'm relatively introverted. You know, I, I like to keep my head down, do the work. And so uh, it's, it's a lot different when you go to a client and say, you know, I want your business. I want to, I want to help you. And without me sort of putting the guardrails on it, that thing can get out of, oh, you can help with this. Well, sure. Build a team around that and we'll do this. And then, you know, and it's fun, but you know, three months into that, you realize you've got your hands in a dozen different things and you want, you want your client to see very specific results. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think in each one of those phases, I, I hopefully did a good job. My intention was to have very clear objectives because with each sort of shifting of gears, it's a whole, you know, uh, acquisition readiness and then moving on to consulting, it's client, you know, client expectation management. And then in the SaaS space, it's education loyalty. Uh, you know, there's, there's different things that you really prioritize based on what you're getting into. And so I think having a good understanding of things and, you know, we mentioned it before, Steve, and I'm, I'm a big believer of this, even as a planner, that at a certain point, planning is guessing. You've got to, you've got to venture out with enough resources, enough foresight, and know that if, if you think you know what's going to happen two months from now, you're, you're absolutely lying to yourself. Nobody knows. And that's the information age that we live in. That's the, that's the human uh, element that's, that's, you know, always present. And so, you know, sort of know, try, try to know what you don't know and lead with your best foot and you know, be willing to, to have confidence to be able to make the best next decision. 
Um, but leading with an objective, those things can be static. You know, you can, if you know how much you want to make reverse engineer it back it up from there, you know, you can, st you can still put the, uh, the, the direction in place and, and work from that as a starting place. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I think that, you know, often entrepreneurs, they, they don't think enough about kind of what they're, why they're doing what they're doing. Right. Uh, and, and they're, the question started out in many people's minds like, Hey, can I sell a little of this stuff on Amazon or uh, can I do this little side hustle? And then it turns into something and then it, it starts to collect its own head of steam without then backing up going, what, what am I really trying to do here? Am I trying to replace my job? Am I trying to create, as you called it earlier, a cash flow business or a, a brand that you want to have a, uh, an exit, you know, so you're building equity towards and, and so forth. People really should spend a little bit of time on that. And uh, we have uh, past Awesomers episodes that talk about that, that you guys can go to awesomers.com and, and search for. Um, Troy, before our last uh, segment, I talked about this idea of maybe some common things that entrepreneurs face, challenges or um, mistakes maybe that they're making. Do you have any examples that you've run across in your current you know, SaaS business where you see people making common assumptions that may or may not be true? Yeah, I think um, I think as the community has grown for FBA sellers, it's been very interesting to see. There's there's a lot of information out there. Uh, what's tough is to know what is the what is the actionable information, right? And so being able to really kind of cut through the noise is really challenging because there is a lot of influencers, there's a lot of voices, you know, and that's that's great. I mean, that's there's nothing wrong with there being a, a really big community. Um, I just I think sometimes it gets to be tricky and. And this is something where I can empathize with sellers to a degree. It gets to be tricky to kind of, you know, sort all that out and filter that information. And so I think this is where folks definitely need to network, find themselves masterminds, really gravitate towards people that they've seen results, they've had success, they can really substantiate their experiences, that are willing to try different things. That's a, that's a constant I see with really successful sellers. Um, they, their failure rate is through the roof. Oh, I've tried that. I've seen that. I've dabbled with that. Like, and those are the types of people you want to kind of gravitate towards. And, and that's where, especially with us, with what we do now with, with data, we want to come from a place of objectivity. You know, this, the subjective experience, it lends itself to being anecdotal and isolated in a vacuum. And we want to see a thousand examples before we say, oh, that's, that's what's going on here, is that this is, this is truly a case where we can share objectively this is factual information. So I think that's, the, that's really the nuanced it's sort of the trade-off of the, of the growing snowball, right? Is that there's just so much information and it can be tricky to go through. And so I'd be lying if I didn't say that's part of why I think I gravitated towards the software, software realm is I kind of, that, that ambiguity leads to, leads to a lot of anxiety because then you, you feel like you don't know what you, what you thought you did and things are changing too fast. And, you know, I wasn't immune to that even when we were at really clipping along and having a successful brand. And so like I said, I really have empathy for, for those first time and even intermediate sellers that are just like, okay, what, what's going on now? You know, the, the shock and the shock of, oh, this is the latest thing that's happening. What are the implications? But, um, you know, I think that's where connecting with like-minded people, getting closer to folks that are, that, whether that's masterminds, that's networking, that's really conversing. So you're not feeling like you're just trying things in isolation because it's so hard to not run the risk of just being anecdotal. And then, then, then you're not quite as informed as you could be to operate at that next level. Yeah, I, I definitely, I want to echo kind of your point here and reinforce it to some extent. The, the reality is people who are, um, even at the intermediate level, you may even be at the advanced level, there are sometimes problems or issues that come up that are discussed within these various communities. And sometimes you'll have opposing answers. Right now, they both may actually be right, you know, and, and each person's experience may be, you know, well, here's what worked for me in this case and, and so forth. But it's hard to parse through all of that. As you call it noise, I think is a good example. But there's there's far more examples of people just being flat out wrong. <laughs> and, and particularly <laughs> as it comes to like legal questions or questions about intellectual property or taxation or, or other things that are complex issues where they're ultimately trusting you know, uh, Slappy the Clown, uh, you know, uh, who's got a Facebook profile, I would just be very, very careful um, with taking on those big topics off, you know, from Facebook. I, I'm always a, a person who likes to find experts in a, in a category. If I'm talking about intellectual property, I may discuss something online 
to have, you know, kind of a meeting of the minds, but I go to my attorneys who are intellectual property experts. By the way, I want to say that clearly, not just an attorney, not somebody with a de law degree, an mm -hmm. intellectual property expert. That's all they do is intellectual property. And the same thing goes if it's a customs related issue or, uh, you know, a, a financial issue. I'm going to go to the CPAs. I'm going to go to people who are experts in the category and just any old CPA off the street doesn't understand, you know, a lot of the e-commerce nuances. So having specialists is really to me a key. Have you found that to be the case at all, Troy? Finding experts is a key to your uh, success and longevity in the business? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tend to get, uh, people give me a hard, hard time in my network. I, I I'll pay the premium, uh, every day and twice on Sunday. If it's somebody that can, address a big with all that liability all that all the potential all the downside you know and, and there's okay those are cases where it's okay to kind of play at a worst case scenario because when the downside is that steep get the right information from the right person and check off the box i mean you know pay the premium be willing to be willing to and that's not always a, a, a foregone conclusion but for me if that's what's needed you know so be it and that's been a, that's been a bit of a paradigm shift for me i used to be a little bit more of a penny pincher of like hey is there a way I can hack this or work around it? But some of those key areas, you know, I, I pay for one of the best attorneys. I've got a really great CPA and I'm, I'm happy. I get peace of mind, uh, which is very hard to, you know, when you're really pushing hard as an entrepreneur, it's, it's hard to quantify the, the peace of mind you get when you have those big things taken by su true subject matter experts. No doubt about it. And I just, one final word of caution, often the entrepreneur world, um, they face, uh, predators and and these predators are often in a feeding frenzy over uninformed or inexperienced entrepreneurs and so this is one of the things I like about you guys as venture at seller tools is that you guys are delivering real value substantial clear you know deliverables each and every month and your clients can see that value it's it's not a predatory situation it's a value exchange I'm gonna give you a stack of money you give me a stack of benefits and that's something that's very clear and very differentiated about your company where there's many other, you know, whether they're SaaS businesses or, you know, any other kind of um, uh, provider of services or, or products, there's all kinds of predatory behavior. And I want to draw a very clear line between those types of characters and somebody who's, uh, you know, um, in it for the long haul and doing the right things, which is, is you guys. When, when you guys started out, did you envision the – you know, setting, <laughs> it may sound strange, but by just doing the right thing that that would make you so differentiated versus a lot of the other uh, noise out there in the market. Yeah. Yeah. I think what really helped us it, oh, and, and it, to this day, it really benefits us is the fact that we're all brand owners. Like we, we focus on our platform in such a way that does this provide utility in our business as Amazon brand owners. And so it's really, it's, it's a one big kind of sandbox. And so same with rolling out our launch platform, we ran tens, if not hundreds of launches, uh, some of which failed because we were testing to figure out, Hey, what's working on Amazon right now on our own brands. And so it's, it's really advantageous for us to take those insights, deploy them in our business, see what kind of reactions we get. Um, it also insulates our customer. You know, we're not, we're not beta testing, uh, to, to the point of failure against our customers. We're taking it against our own brands to really see, hey, are these insights actionable? Does this data useful? Does this, you know, is this launch exactly what Amazon wants? And does it check off all those boxes? So I think that's really, really served us. And we try to leverage that too. I think that's something that uh, rightfully so. If you're, if, you're a, if you're the customer avatar, make it as high utility, make that value prop so steep for you that when you come to market, it's a, it's a no brainer. Yeah, I for sure, in the software world, we call that eating your own dog food. And uh, it turns out if it doesn't taste bad, then, you know, have a big bowl of it. It's no problem. Uh, and so I think that's really smart. Uh, we talked earlier about some of the common maybe mistakes that people make. Are there things that people approach keywords or relevancy in general on Amazon in a way that you think needs to be corrected? And uh, maybe you could share any insights that you have about, you know, people's perceptions about keywords and relevancy yeah yeah i think the the very first thing is that keywords are often neglected um i think a lot of the times um and i did this in the past as well so i'm i'm as guilty of it as anybody else is you just think it's a box to check it's just okay i did my i did my keyword research i built out my listing done with new metrics like relevancy percentage it's a it's it's a really 
it's a metric you want access into into continuity because you want to see how your keyword, how Amazon views your keyword relevancy from uh, PPC performance, organic performance, that this interplay where with that finger on the pulse, you have no idea how Amazon's deeming the relevancy percentage, which positively increases your, or excuse me, decreases your PPC ad spend, uh, which helps with organic rank. There's, there's just so many important and crucial pieces there. Um, but getting, get, really stressing keywords is so important um, because they are, are the puzzle pieces on Amazon. It's, you know, um, I mean, I could, I, I could go on a soapbox with this, but it's just really understanding that you've really got to commit enough time to it. If Amazon puts a disproportionate amount of focus on something, that's, that's your red flag of, okay, I need to spend as much time on this as well. And, you know, as a team, we used to joke about when we did this manually, we would spend an entire work week on doing keyword research. That's, you know, that's five and into the, into the weekend days of full days of sitting down. And what we would do is play the part of the customer. So we'd use auto suggest and we'd kind of try to try to act like the, the customer. So it was this really rough and raw keyword research. Nowadays for, for Amazon sellers, you have so many efficiencies, you have so many tools to leverage. You've got so, so many great insights and so much data, data that you can manage that your keyword research should rightfully take uh, enough time for something that is such a high, high priority. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's the starting place. And then really keeping a pulse on some of those important metrics. You know, when you touch on relevancy percentage, that's, we rightfully put that at the top spot because it is an Amazon metric. It's nothing that we're coming up with any math or formula to. It's just Amazon telling us this product, this, this keyword, how relevant are you, which, course is always indicative of how you're going to rank, how your PPC is going to perform. It's got that cascade effect on everything else that you, you do on Amazon. So, um, so yeah, I think focusing on it first and foremost, and then revisiting your listing that sometimes requires you to re-optimize your listing, to pivot some of your PPC efforts. Um, it, it really is the, the center from which everything that pertains to visibility is impacted. Yeah, I, I quite agree. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to try to say this right, but it's going to sound contradictory. So uh, let's give me a second to explain. So uh, Amazon, as you alluded to earlier, is in fact binary, right? Mm -hmm. It's a computer making decisions. Uh, however, Amazon is also highly dynamic. And so that means sometimes those binary things can change. And mm -hmm. if without you understanding that, hey, you had great relevance today or yesterday and sales are going great, but two weeks from now, that may not be the case because your competitors increase their relevancy or some other change in an algorithm or whatever it is, it's both binary, so you can talk and figure out what the computer is looking at for ranking or other purposes, but it is also dynamic. It changes regularly, and that's a really good reason to stay vigilant. So I, I love all of that advice and I, I love what you guys are doing. Troy, uh, get out your crystal ball as we close up the show and give me a, a sense in five years what either the e-commerce landscape or the Amazon marketplace in general, how's that going to look in five years from now? Yeah, I think, I think uh, Whole Foods is going to serve as a case study. I think there's going to be category specific opportunities based on Amazon's larger roadmap. I think they're going to continue to gobble up different entities that are going to have potential synergy. Uh, that may lend to a retail presence for brands that at one point couldn't couldn't have that uh, accessibility, um, and so I think in the short term that's going to have that's going to have an impact. But I also think in terms of the omni-channel implications, we're starting to see even though that disparity exists with Walmart, you you have the opportunity to take more of a smaller pie. And so I think brand owners going in understanding that they they should have some measure of omni-channel. Uh, strategy. Don't, don't get stretched too thin. My philosophy is always go deep before you go wide. Um, and so I think that's, that's another key part of the equation, but we're never going to see social proof or influencer marketing or, you know, really seeing however reviews take form. I think we're going to see that shift and evolve uh, on Amazon, off Amazon. So I think that's another crucial piece of the equation is how you figure out how to, um, as a brand, how to create social proof in its various forms. Um, so I think those are, those are kind of the three big things. Going where Amazon's going, have an omni-channel presence, and then figuring out so, social proof is, you know, when, when, when the model of Amazon is product showing up to your door, somebody else has to tell you it's great for you to realize that transaction, right? And so you've got to really think about the customer 
which again, this is where you kind of have to disassociate and think about, okay, why did I buy this? You know, was it something I found? Well, then did I search somewhere? And you know, Amazon's bringing in expert recommendations. That's a change to the landscape. And so I think, I think the evolution of that is going to, um, is going to be key for brand owners that really want to stay, stay ahead. Well, yeah, you're quite right. Again, the, this, this world we live in is dynamic. It's changing. It's fun. That's kind of what makes it fun to me. It's also challenging. That's what makes it worth a uh, game worth playing, I, I suppose. And uh, I definitely think a lot of those predictions are, are, you know, going to happen. And, you know, I want to just reinforce the omni-channel perspective. I love the fact that Amazon Marketplace and Amazon in general has, you know, huge opportunity. We talked about it earlier and it's growing and continued opportunity. But I also don't want people to think of it in a single channel unless that's just a short-term cash flow play. If you're really a brand owner, I want you to think omni-channel. I want you to think about other things because there are real opportunities that exist out there. Um, and there will be, and I talked about it in the prior episode, but there are marketplaces developing all over the, 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 the roadmap. Uh, places like Albertsons and, you know, in the future Target and, um, you know, Best Buy and, and all of these places are going to be different marketplaces. So it's a, it's a great time to be in business. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. Troy, I want to thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it having you on the show. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate it as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always great to catch up with an awesomer out there uh, like Troy. Uh, for the awesomers out there listening at home or in the car or wherever you are, we'll be right back after this. Empower. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empower is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Okay, everybody, that wraps up today's episode. And this is the end, actually, of our three-part series with Troy Johnston. And, you know, I'm always just flabbergasted by the amount of brilliant and just thoughtfulness that entrepreneurs have. And again, Troy is a personification of just taking a measured approach and being you know, thoughtful about how you how we get into this business. How do we serve customers? How are the paradigms different between these different business models he's been associated with? And he took you now in this three part series through his journey from being an employee at like a, a big agency and then into his own consultation business and then into his today present SaaS business and all of which encompasses some of the the product development business that he's been a part of and and probably continues to be a part of today. So all of those lessons he's able to share with us, and I find it to be very instructive and something that I uh, have a tremendous amount of uh, respect for. So this again was uh, episode number 123 of the Osmers podcast series. All you need to do is go to osmers.com 123 to find today's show notes details and uh, even the link to how you can get connected to uh, Troy's very impressive and very essential tool uh, that is presented by Empower. It gives you a little bit of an upfront discount. Even if you're not an Empower member, you can take advantage of the discount. And Empower members on the back end also get some cash back on top of it. So there's uh, a great uh, win-win for everybody. And again, I have no personal affiliation. I say that as a matter of disclosure, uh, not for kudos. Uh, but I love the fact that uh, the guys at Seller Tools have worked with Empowery to get all of you listening this special advantage. Let's make sure we take advantage of that today. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Osmers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again. Awesomers.com.